Hello and welcome back to another responsive, responsive, response video. I'm your host, Phil Willis. And uh, this is in response to the Stargate Atheism Reaction Part 2 video. Um, I woke up this morning. I don't really keep on top of this minute by minute or day by day or anything like that. Well, lately day by day. But um, I've had videos with a lot more views. I had a lot less comments, so I'm not used to keeping up with as many responses. But... I'm going to try at least a little bit and make another video here. And the uh, Brenda boy's like, ah, Jim uh, went into beast mode with some great points. I was going to write a comment, but she pretty much said what I was thinking. So I admire, uh, Jim, I'll say this before I even start. I admire that you wrote all these responses. And so hopefully I can do some justice. I did respond text-wise to some of them, but my time is somewhat limited. So I couldn't, uh, it takes longer usually to respond than probably took to write out some of these comments so i said let me let me up another video real quick because i can talk faster than, than i can write and if it takes me 40 minutes to respond then you can imagine how long it would take to type all this stuff out and some of these stuff i responded to um there's a whole spe special there's a whole lot of special pleading that your god is qualified to judge according to your gospel someone who has an evil thought and restrains it is evil rather than being a signifier of good character and goodness etc etc um it, you know the, the yes god god is the creator of all life uh, yeah i mean that is you know when you get into arguing against the christian god you know and 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 we're, we have to you know and and we're going to argue back as christians we are going to argue from that presuppositional standpoint that we're talking about the god of the bible the way he's explained in the bible and the reasons he gives in the bible and we're just going to stand on that and you can definitely hate it you can you can reject it that's the Bible says people are going to reject it uh, left and right. The Bible makes it clear. This is something that gets re rejected by by all kinds of people. They just don't want to accept God for whatever the reasons are, uh, mostly because they want to follow their own internal compass uh, and do what they want, which is which is fair. That's your that's your you know that's the the prerogative that He has given you while you're alive on this this earth. So. If you take something from me without my consent, the return of better condition still violated my consent. Th this is a fair, po fair, fair point here. Um, the analogy that I used about the purse snatcher giving it back with millions of dollars is is my analogies are not always one for one uh, perfect there. So you know maybe to clarify that a little bit, God didn't take something that belonged to us and then give it back even better when He takes a baby's life, right? He lent the baby something that we that we know as humans we don't have forever anyways right god get god when god gives us life so to speak he lends it to us we all know we're going to die this is the reality of life the bible makes it clear why we're going to die but god is the giver and the taker of life so if if he lends a you know a, a, you know if you lend uh, your child a car it is a gift even if you're just lending it to them it's a gift for a time so a more accurate way of saying is God gives us the gift of life for a time to do with as within a limited uh, freedom that he's given us. We can't choose to do anything we want. I can't just instantly take myself to the moon because I really want to or anything like that. There are, There's a limited subset, but, but he's given us a, a, a life of a limited duration that he has the right to take away whenever he wants. And for some people, he's given 70 years. For some people, he's given only seven, you know, seven years to live. Some people, it's only seven minutes to live. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gave us something that we didn't even deserve to begin with. That's the way a Christian looks at it. So uh, when he takes away a life, you're right. The analogy of the purse snatcher is not a great one because it doesn't accurately reflect the, the gift of life such as it is, is a temporary gift that he has the right to claim back whenever he wants because he's not giving us um, this, you know, eternal life here on earth. So a fair point and and i hope i clear that up a bit um secular ethics uh improve because we learn an ethical code uh that doesn't evolve when flaws contradictions and new knowledge is revealed is a faulty system 
uh, you know, Christianity would look at this exactly the opposite and whatever have you, because uh, it seems as we've moved along, secular ethics have not improved. They've devolved. They've gotten worse uh, from a conserve. And it isn't just Christians who believe that. Of course, conservatives, by their definition, they want to conserve the old ways, believe that we've gotten worse as time has gone on. So that's going to be something we agree to disagree on, <laughs> uh, that, that it's improved. Uh, there's certainly some things that improved. There's a lot of things that have not, uh, that have gotten worse. Uh, an ethical code that doesn't involve in flaws, contradictions, and knowledge is revealed. Well, Christians don't really feel that there's any flaws or contradictions in the Bible, so that's not really a problem for us. Uh, we don't feel that there's flaws and contradictions uh, in the directions that God has has given us, so we don't we don't feel that that's a, a big issue. Of course, you know you do, and we can agree to disagree on that. Um, and whatever have you. I'm going to skip this comment because I'm not exactly sure what we're referencing here. There's a couple of comments that reference like, hey, you missed the point of this Stargate clip in the context of like season nine, da, 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 and the alien and the Orion. Like, look, look, guys, guys, I said it at the beginning of the last video. I didn't watch Stargate season nine. I really need to get to it. I, I get it. A lot of shows I need to watch. I did watch a number of seasons of Stargate. I do like the show. I love the show. I need to love it a little bit more, so I watched the rest of it. But at the time that I was first watching it, we didn't have nine seasons. So I watched up to a point, and then I went on to other things. I watched what I had, and then I went on to other things. Since then, we've had later seasons, and it's been out for a while now, and I never went back to it. So I need to do that. With that being said, I didn't choose this this clip. I didn't, I didn't look for trouble. I didn't look for this. It was a clip that an atheist friend gave me to say, this, this is my reason that I don't believe in Christianity, this clip sums up, summarizes why I believe the way I believe from an atheist. It wasn't me, it was her. So I am addressing the points made in this clip in a vacuum because she gave me the clips in a vacuum and I would be willing to bet money because I had a talk with her about this that she just took that clip out of context as well in, in understanding her points, right? When we were discussing these points from the video, she didn't bring up anything about the history of Stargate and the ORI or anything along those lines. This is a conversation that while it is between a fictional character dealing with a fictional race that does not, that, that is, does not directly represent Christianity um, is nonetheless making points for uh, you know for, uh, for atheism and against organized religion uh, in broad and to a lot of points in specific christianity okay so um it was at the intention of the writers i don't know i wasn't there in the writing room or whatever have you i will say i have watched dozens of seasons of 80s and 90s sci-fi and i've said it before there's a lot of humanistic messaging and humanistic bent and and uh, you know and and painting religion a negative light in those shows and so that's why i said for the most part i love the shows and i think they make some really great arguments say you know so to speak um but of course i don't agree with a lot of their arguments i still love them and i still i still watch them the Gospels are not eyewitness te testimonies. They were earliest written 50 to 60 years after the alleged events, um, and we possess to no extent uh, no copies of these records from before the, the third, third century. Um, so, so if you have a witness who reports to somebody, they write down that's an eyewitness testimony. If you have an eyewitness who tells it to somebody who tells it to somebody, it's still an eyewitness testimony. Okay, insofar that it is an accurate representation of what this eyewitness said. And because the manuscripts, as they go out throughout the ages of antiquity and whatever, well, let me, let, me, uh, let me point out another thing too. A lot of the historical ancient documents that we have, if you go to like writings of Plato or anything like that, are nowhere close to 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, and we don't have any problem accepting that they are accurate and true to what Plato had originally intended and wrote, right? So we have a lot more Christian manuscripts of the New Testament that are much closer to the time than most other works of antiquity. And we have many, many, many more manuscripts. And these manuscripts, you know, if you have copies of copies of copies, if you play the telephone game, usually these copies are going to have a lot of problems and flaws with the originals. And they're going to have differences with each other as the branches of the tree go up. And yet, when you compare all these manuscripts in Christianity and the New Testament, they're very, 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 very similar. 
uh, and, 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 and downright scary how close they are. So while that doesn't prove that the New Testament is true, what it does prove is that we can have we can have reliability in regards that these manuscripts are indeed an accurate representation of the testimony of those eyewitnesses. Now, you could say that they're liars, they were delusional. That's a whole nother rabbit hole to go down. But as far as the argument that the New Testament in particular, and even most of the Old Testament, is somehow a misrepresentation because over the years, as the Mormons would say, plain and precious truths have been lost is, 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 is not true. Um, even if you send Hitler to, to hell, there would come a day in infinite time where you are doing harm for the actions he did not commit. So the argument here, infinite punishment for a finite set of crimes is always infinitely unjust. Um, first of all, I've, I've said this a couple of times, I don't necessarily buy into the argument that it's infinite punishment. It just could just simply be infinite destruction, right? Because when the flesh passes away, the spirit lives on by the grace of God. He is the source of all life. When we say, I don't want to be with you, God, we are telling God we do not want to be with him. That means we don't want his blessings. His blessings do include light, warmth, uh, you know, happiness, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and and you think about life without God's blessings here on earth, that's pretty scary stuff. Um, I've just been in a dark, quiet room before. That can be scary enough without even any fire, flames, torture me or anything along those lines. That alone can give me a huge panic and an unhappiness and disturb me greatly. There was this one, uh, there's this one room in the middle of a desert that scientists have made that's completely soundproof and very, very, like, sound no sound at all and you can't be in it for more than 40 minutes i think or 30 minutes or something like that without starting to go get vertigo and going crazy it's just insane because it just swallows up all sound and and, and just even without the blessing of sound we start to go crazy uh and whatever have you uh, but another christian argument is that you are thrown into a lake of fire you're consumed as in fire and so you are just simply destroyed which is god's prerogative he gave life he can take it away he gave you your spirit he can destroy your spirit that's why jesus says you know um fear not those who could destroy the flesh but rather those who can destroy the, the the spirit and and i've made no bones about it uh yes whether you like it or not uh you know the, the bible is is very clear jesus himself who everyone says oh he's a peaceful loving guy jesus himself talked more about hell than heaven and, and they do tell you about the, the problems and concerns and you can call it fear mongering and everything else but it's true um, that he calls out those, those those a lot more than he talks about heaven so and again if it was a doctor trying to give you a miracle pill you wouldn't you wouldn't call that fear mongering you would call that loving uh, concern uh, and whatnot if the roadmap was perfect it would account for the mistakes that people would make um, and and there's an Isaac short story about multi-generational created positronic brain running large swaths of the world and there's an investigation how an accident had happened that ended up ending the career of a few people okay um yeah no um <laughs> to say that you had to have a roadmap that's that first of all a big problem here is the word mistakes okay um the, a lot of the misunderstandings in the Bible, sometimes they're from honest mistakes, that's sure. But the Bible makes no bones about the vast majority of our rebellion and our sinful activity is from willing, willingly, knowingly breaking God's word, which is what we're all doing here when we raise our fist in the air and say, I don't want, I don't want God. So, um, you know. That, that's that it's all willing willingly willing sin and we tend to look at the stuff through the lens of our uh, of our you know of our eyesight and the thing is yeah logically it doesn't make sense if you try let's say i have bad eyesight uh, i'm nearsighted i believe uh so somebody makes a sign that adjusts for my vision but the thing is the more you adjust for my vision the worse it gets for that vision over there it's not it's not uh, possible to adjust for all of the broken messed up vision, even if it was just purely a, a mistake that's out there, whatever have you. However, however, the Bible is also, uh, the Bible is also very clear. God has, has adjusted for that. It's called the gift of the Holy Spirit. So those who truly seek him uh, can read his word with the help of the Holy Spirit 
and and find the, the you know find his truth and his love and the important messages of the bible through that lens and millions and millions of people including myself have so the map is pretty pretty darn good and if you need help navigating it's it's right there jesus said knock and i'll answer the door type of thing uh, representation matters. I'm not really sure exactly to what that's referring to. I need a little more context there to speak more to it uh, and whatnot. Uh, hear that a lot from 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 uh, liberals and and everything else. And I'm, I I suppose for what it's worth, I wrote a comic, uh, a web comic, many years ago. I spent a lot of time on it. Spent years on it. Uh, my main character is 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 uh, a, a lady and uh, a different race and all that other jazz. My family, very mixed family, lots of different uh, races and whatever have you. Not, I'm, I'm not really big on this whole thing. Uh, either way, we, you know, I got family from all over the world and they're pretty pretty happy with 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 uh, with stuff. Um, objective does not mean anything outside of you because by that standard, you tell if you tell someone ice cream good, that's objective. Well, if I say, Gemma loves ice cream because her blog post says so, that's an objective statement, right? Because it's something we can point to, we can verify because it's a fact that's outside of myself. So it's a fact about your opinion. It's an objective statement about your subjective feelings, right? Um, the When it comes to ethics and stuff like that, uh, and I, when I wrote the reply here, I, I used the, 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 one of the dictionary definitions of objective means not being influenced by personal feelings or opinions in considering and representing facts. So when we get to ethics, which is purely philosophical for the most part, um, when we say objective, when I say my ethics are objective, I do mean my objectives are coming from an authoritative source outside. So one way, as I re reply here, one way to do objective ethics, so to speak, is to build your foundation on ethics from an authorized source outside of your own opinion, which is for a Christian is, is God's word. We don't just get to make up our rules as, as we go along. If I'm doing something like I'm stealing from somebody and someone comes up to me and says, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, you know what? Uh, I'm doing this because I want to. They can say, well, the, the Bible says don't steal. So that that's wrong. Um, there is a difference between the critique of organized religion and the exploitation of people by deities and more advanced aliens and actually directly critiquing Christianity. Stargate is the former, not the, the latter. And I never stated otherwise, right? I, 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 I never never stated that the Stargate clip was a direct confrontation and critique of Christianity. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've, I've said this at least a few times at this point, that overall, most of the shows of that time period argue for humanism. Humanism is, is pretty much the belief that humanity is going to solve all of its own problems in time. So the wars, the disease, the famine, Star Trek does this through its depiction of a utopian paradise just about that they've established by, you know, through proper leveraging of science, they must have the perfect politics to govern their own planets, et cetera, et cetera. They have very few internal problems and those don't show up until much later shows. But uh, especially the early years of Star Trek and Star Trek The Next Generation were very much like there's just very, very little um, wrong in the Federation and they don't, they don't even use money. They don't even have money for crying out loud, right? They've solved all of their own problems. They don't need money to address the scarcity of goods and services. So, uh, you know, go, go figure that one out. Christianity, at least the Nicene Christianity, spread at the point of Constantine's sword and continued with arrows, cannons, eventually guns, never really slowing down. The pre-Nicene Christians were also wiped out at the point of sword and fire and whatever have you. There, I, I mentioned this in one of those response videos. There were as many people who say they're Christian and then do bad things in the name of Christianity. It doesn't mean that they are Christian. The, the basic tenets of Jesus, when Peter rose his sword up, he said, Peter, put away your sword. Um, you know, Christianity even goes so far. God, you know, God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. When someone hurts, you know, your family, you're to leave it to the government and God to 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 get true justice. You're not to go after that vengeance yourself. Uh, things like that. Christianity in its in its written form. And that's why I tend to evaluate when I evaluated Islam, when I evaluated all the other religions, I go to their holy text. I don't judge them by their people who claim to be them because sometimes those people are just using people want to do evil things 
this is a reality of life. People want to do everything. And and they will use whatever excuse they want to to do that, right? There are millions killed in the name of atheism and 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 there's millions killed in the name of government civility, right? And 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 needing to keep the government yeah. The people will kill for whatever reason. It doesn't mean that that's an accurate representation of atheistic ethics. It doesn't mean that those people represent Islam super well or any of those others. You have to look at their writings and say, does the writing tell, does their holy teachings tell them to go out and kill people who don't agree with them and stuff like that? Christianity does, does just the opposite um, and whatnot. We already go out and preach the gospel. So we talk. And when we get struck, we turn the other cheek. That's what Jesus taught. So, uh, and whatever have you. Remind us again and again that the Bible writers chose to say God is good. It isn't an argument. It isn't defense. It's just saying no matter what he does, it automatically good because it's him doing it. Uh, I've given out some other reasons. This isn't the only reason. It is, uh, you know, a Christian, uh, a Christian such as myself, I'm going to argue from the Bible standpoint when it comes to uh, defending God and his nature and everything like that. Yes, I'm going to argue from a biblical standpoint. Uh, in order to argue about God, you have to presuppose God exists, right? And and in doing that, I'm going to use the God of the Bible. I'm going to use the Bible and what it says about his characteristics and everything else. I've also given some other logical arguments. The one who loaned you life has the right to call it back whenever he wants, for example. That seems very reasonable. Um, and whatever have you. God never promised you 70 peaceful years on earth when he gave you life. So he does have the right to call it back in whichever manner he sees fit, whenever he wants. Um, that, is the, that is the right of the creator. Uh, that is not just what the Bible says. I think that's also pretty darn logical. I know from a very human -y standpoint, uh, we try to use the analogy of the 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 parent who had the child doesn't have the right to take away the child's life whenever they want, so God doesn't have the right to do the same to us. But human parents, uh, you know, who, who carry around a child for nine months isn't the same as God. So uh, God is the one who truly makes your spirit. He's the one who is um, not only uh, able to, to make those decisions because he gave us life with a... Uh, um, you know, with the with the you know with the with the conditions and everything that are mentioned over and over again in the Bible, but he's also the one true and holy judge because he's the one person that can look into man's heart and truly judge them based on the condition of their heart. Because if if let's say you want to truly murder people and the only thing keeping you from murdering people is the fact that you are tied up in chains or the fact that you know the government will throw you in prison, that's the only thing holding you back and you hate God and you hate your fellow man, the only thing holding you back is the fact that there is a punishment hanging over your head. Well, you're not going to go to heaven. We don't probably want you in heaven. <laughs> especially once you find out there are no consequences because God's not supposed to hold anybody accountable, you're going to start murdering people, right? So, uh, you know, there's a number of other reasons I've, I've given. And of course, you can a quick Googling will find you even more reasons but written by more elegant and well-thought-out Christians than myself because I've also never claimed to be at all to be the most well-thought-out. Uh, the nerve structures link in the brain, don't, uh, we're talking about uh, unborn children here don't exist before the 29th week. Um, I will point out that that's, that's not what WebMD says. Uh, it says many in the medical community believe that there's a clear evidence that a fetus, a developing baby in the womb, can't feel pain until many of the medical community feel that they can't feel pain until the 24th week, not to, not to 29th week, which is a huge difference. Um, but other scientists say it's possible for the fetus to feel pain as early as 12 weeks and whatever have you. Um, and most of the disagreement centers on whether or not certain parts of the brain nervous system must be fully developed before the fetus can feel pain. So I just want to, I, I just want to, can a, feel, can a fetus that doesn't have conscious awareness yet really experience it? There are no easy answers, but the debate has implications. So I want to point out a couple of things here. First of all, when I said what I said, I wasn't trying to misrepresent anything about science because, again, this is from WebMD. I'm pretty sure that's not a Christian organization. Uh, and there is a lot of debate about this in the community. So I was taking my information from what I had read from other sources. Number one, so I wasn't trying to intentionally deceive anybody. Uh, but number two, 
here's the thing. Scientists disagree, period. Where exactly does life begin? So scientists disagree because you can't prove it. It's a philosophical argument. Does it begin in zero days, three weeks, five weeks, 10 weeks, 20 weeks, whatever have you? It's a scientific e. Uh, it's it's it, you, you don't, it's a philosophical argument, and you can't science something that's purely philosophical is lying wrong. You can't test that in a beaker. You can't do the scientific method on that. So when exactly does life begin? That's why scientists are divided on this. And generally speaking, when we don't know in any other part of life, we err on the side of life. So for example, when you're destroying a building, you're getting a permit from the government to destroy a building, and you're about to go and destroy it. You have a legal obligation to do a full survey of that building, no matter how long it's been emptied, to make sure there's nobody in there, because sometimes somebody will sneak in there and move in. You have to do that. If you don't do that, then you can be found guilty for not doing the proper process and procedure, because you have to presume there's life in there whenever there's any doubt. You have to do the proper procedure. If you, heaven forbid, you kill somebody, you'll be charged for manslaughter. Because the judge is going to say, in a, in a place where there is any doubt at all that life does or doesn't exist, it's your responsibility as the one committing the action to make sure there's no life in that building before you clear it out. So now you're guilty, not of outright bloody murder, but you are guilty of something called you know, manslaughter. There's even involuntary manslaughter, I think, but you're at least guilty of manslaughter. So you, you should have done your due process before you cleared out that you know, before you cleared out that building and stuff like that. Um, you know, uh, sometimes use the analogy of the, the child who likes to hide in the hay in the farm. And one day his, his, his father goes out and he doesn't see Jimmy. He needs to pitchfork that hay. Does he have a re moral responsibility knowing that his, history, his son might be hiding in a hay to check before he starts going poke, poke, poke? Probably. So in the case where we don't know and you know what? You don't you don't have to take you don't have to take my word um, for this uh, in terms of we don't know or don't know. You know, uh, one one person who emphatically said this is above my pay grade when it was asked when does life begin. One person who's very very famous on the liberal side uh, said it's above my pay grade. It was President Barack Obama. If you don't know, which he doesn't know, you err on the side of life until you know for a fact. Um, the doctor analogy that I used about, you know, the doctor knows that this is that this is a pill that can save lives is proved and tested. Christianity is not by design. Uh, you know, the Christians would disagree with you, right? Like Christians have tested God and have found uh, in a manner of speaking uh, when we became Christians, we saw the change in our life. So we know that we're forgiven. We know that our lives have been changed. The people around us know that our lives have been changed. So there's evidence that this pill, so to speak, absolutely, um, absolutely does work. There's a lot of evidences uh, supporting a lot of the uh, a lot of the assertions of the Bible and, and whatever have you. you choose not to accept those evidences and that's your prerogative. But it is proven and tested from our perspective. So that's why my argument uh, it just explains why Christians are so fervent about spreading the gospel message and spend so much time doing so, so much energy doing so. You've not substantiated an ex explanation for why creation of a sentient being allows you absolute right over that being. Um, so if you create a sentient being, do you have absolute right uh, over that being? Uh, that is an ethical you know, an ethics question, the Bible says yes, I will say yes, you say no. So we can agree to disagree on that. I don't think there's, um, uh, you know, the Bible, uh, the Bible gives some harsh language here in terms of using up, you know, a potter who creates a bunch of different pots and some of them are for ceremonial uses and some of them are, are made for destruction to be melted down again or used for other purposes that are less than honorable. Um, people used to use pots for bathrooms, for example. Uh, that's the that's what the Bible says. God has that right over our lives, and who are we to question him? I know that's hard for a modern person who thinks they are all of that to, to accept, but God is God, and I am not. I can never see a part of the picture that he's painting. I don't have his perspective. I'm going to use a little Stephen Kirsch Chapman there. Um, 
you can look up that song. But the 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 the, the explanation and if it was just if it was just somebody who was a finite creator creating a sentient being, I would agree with you, Gemma. The thing is, God has other qualifications. He's omnipotent, omnipresent. He can see our hearts. He can see inside of us. And that's why he has absolute rights over, and he's perfectly holy and just. It's all of these reasons why he is in, He is righteous and able and everything else to to, to perfectly judge us, uh, uh, you know, objectively and everything else, because he is, he is, um, he has all the qualifications that no human being could even come close to having, even if that human being somehow created a sentient life like Frankenstein. That's the kind of argument that was just about creating a slave race and claiming you've created them. They have no right to their own existence choices in life. Uh, we don't really technically have choices. We don't have our own rights. We have no rights aside from what is given to us. America was founded on the idea that we have God-given rights. Those are rights that God has given to us. That's why we call them God-given rights. Without God, we don't have any rights aside from what our government prescribes to us or whatever it may be. And even those rights can be taken away from the government on a whim because they're not. That's why Americans' rights to free speech and things like that are you know, a bit more protected because our original documents refer to these God-given truths, these God-given rights. We're appealing to a higher authority than any government. When it's just based on the government, the government can change its mind and take those rights away, and they're ethically able to do so because they are the highest authority, you know, so to speak, uh, and whatnot. So uh, there you go. But but in his, you know, in his in, in God's wisdom, he gave us a limited a limited window of time in our life down here on Earth to make our own choices. So we're not just robots and automatons with a gun held to our head. He put enough in this world that's reasonable to believe in him, but left enough out to where um, you don't you, you know that 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 you can also not believe him and have that be um, you know and, and, and have that choice. So there you go. Um, you are deciding what is good and bad based on your interpretation of a chosen holy book. Uh, yeah, and that, that, that is that is true, but it's also the interpretation many other people have. We have back pain because our entire physical frame still suffers from limited limited evolutionary adaptations to being upright. Well, there you go. Uh, that that there you there. Well, however you want to frame it. Uh, I, I'm not against evolution uh, myself. I wasn't here when the world began. Uh, scientists, Christian scientists, used christian or uh use science to understand god better they figured if they could understand the processes and procedures and the exact steps of how babies are born or how plants survive and things like that and biology and figure out the laws of physics and stuff they would understand the, the mind of god even better so we um i have no problem with um with 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 with, with science and if it turns out for a fact that we were evolved uh, yeah, that's fine. God used evolution. He's the one who invented evolution, et cetera, et cetera. I wasn't there, so I know most Christians would argue with me of that. They believe totally in creationism like that. I think either way can can be God. So uh, let's see. I'll be right back. And I'm back. If you guys are capable of conveying the reasoning for acting in a blatant, monstrous way, then that's another power that you think your God lacks. No, God gives reasoning. You just choose not to accept it. It's there. He's actually quite capable, and he has done so. The Jesus described in your gospel is pretty unambiguously explicit. You are not allowed to engage in violence, even in matters of self-defense. Um, actually, there is, like, so Jesus was talking about somebody who's striking you in the other cheek or whatever have you in terms of coming at you for preaching the gospel or whatever have you. There's plenty of Bible passages, quite a few, that talk about protecting your house, your home, etc., etc. And then there's also the rules about following your government. So you can be called on your government and a draft to defend your country and stuff. And and that is something that the that you know the Bible supports. I studied lots of religions when I was younger. And, and by the way, you can Google. I, I can't go into super detail on any one of these points because then uh, the video will go on past an hour and, and videos that last an hour are already too long. So according to Google and according to y'all. So uh, if you want me to pick one particular topic out and do a, a long show on it, I can certainly try to do that. But there are plenty of, of Christian websites I can go into that you can easily Google up that go into more details um, on any of these. But the, but the quick answer is that, yes, you, you are commanded by the Bible. 
uh, to go ahead and do self-defense and all that other jazz. Let's see here. The Jesus described in your Gospels is pretty ambiguously explicit. You're not, okay, we already did that one. I say lots of religions when I'm younger, and then reels of a basic apologetic spiel about other religion. You even go on about the virgin wives lie because Jesus never promises mansions in heaven or anything like that uh, and whatnot. I think you're talking about Islam or whatever have you. Um, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, type of thing or virgins or whatever have you. Um, this is just Google AI. The Quran promises both men and women purified spouses, mates in paradise, whether from their time on earth or among heaven or heavenly beings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, seventy-two. Uh, this idea of the seventy-two version of paradise for a modern, which appears nowhere in the Quran, is a myth, but it does it does have that kind of deal, right? Ever have you? Muhammad mentions a number of sayings, including one that everyone will have two wives from the Horus. Uh, everyone gets extra wives. That's uh, there you go. So. So um, they they there there's another answer by Cura here. Apparently they do get 72. I don't know. I know the number is between two and 72 somewhere. So I don't think I'm misrepresenting Islam there. Or that I've seen that numerous times and, and whatnot. So uh, I'm sure I could pull up the exact passage in verse if you're really dying to. But um, I know also Mormonism is along the same lines. Uh, I know that for a fact. I live here in Utah. And I've studied a lot of Mormonism. Again, I could pull up exact scripture and quotes and all of that other jazz. Because Jesus never promises uh, mansions or anything in heaven uh, like that. He, goes, he says, I go to prepare a, a place for you and whatnot. Uh, it is kind of curious. Does does Christ promise mansions? Does he? Let's find out. I never really paid much attention to this because I know for the most part, uh, oh, yeah, many mansions. Now, I don't know if that's a translation issue, though. So this is from John 14, 1 through 3. And if we look up John 14 ESV, I tend to use the ESV because it's a more it's a more um, literal translation. And so he doesn't say mansions. He says a place for you, I think, uh, and whatever have you. So, I mean you know, slightly different word in, in there. A mansion could be a place for you type of thing. Uh, in my father's house are many mansions. Okay, what will I say? In my father's house are many rooms. Rooms, mansions, that's close enough. Uh, so you do you will have a room, I, I guess, if, if you think a room's really great or a mansion or whatever have you. But the Bible does talk a lot about you will be worshiping God. That is the key purpose of going to heaven is worshiping God. Um, oh, look, somebody else who isn't Gemma. Um, this is exactly what Christianity proposes. If you become friends with the judge, he will let you off the hook. Uh, we have quite a few um, responses. I wrote to that about an hour ago. Being friends doesn't cut it. You have to follow him as your Lord and sa Savior. It's a bit deeper than, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, than, than just that. In order to become his friend, I heard what you're saying, but you're not really refuting my observation. Meanwhile, Christianity can't agree. Oh boy, we got, I don't know why we just don't put this in one message, guys. If you're gonna like, why not just put this into one, 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 one message? I, I don't know. Uh, and whatever have you. So you become reconciled to God. Are you his friend at that point? Um, I know some people say you are his friend. You are definitely his beloved. Uh, God, you know, Jesus refers to the church as his beloved bride and things like that. So, you know, you, you are um, his beloved, uh, if nothing else. Friend is kind of a loosey-goosey term. I don't know if it really applies. The Bible, I don't like to use the word Bible doesn't use. It doesn't use the word friend. But you're not refuting my observation. You're just pointing out the steps a person must take. Uh, meanwhile, the Christians can't agree on things like such a sin of verb. What counts as a sin? Are we bored, scheduled for hell? And some other things we can't agree on. I've said this before. I've made no bones about it. There's 40,000 different denominations or whatever the number is. 1,000 to 40,000 is probably a number in there somewhere. And I don't think it matters much if it's 1,000 or 40,000. I don't think there's a lot of difference. The whole point is there's a bunch of denominations and whatever have you. Because Christians do disagree. Uh, and you have differences you know, between the state lines and the country lines. I talked about this in my video. I don't hide the ball. And the Bible doesn't hide. You know, you know who talks about this fractioning? is the Bible. 
The Bible talks about this, and Paul addresses this directly about the fraction of the Bible. It's not what God wanted. You know what else you can find in the church? Divorce. You know what God doesn't like? Divorce. Okay? Christians who follow God are sinful too. They are... Um, they are struggling with the same problems that everybody else is struggling with. Now, one thing I hear a lot is that the divorce in the church is the same as outside the church, and therefore there's no evidence for God, because after all, you'd expect Christians to to live holier lives than everybody else and, and be able to be more loving and caring and all of that. I can't argue against that logic. One of, my, uh, one of the favorite songs I like to listen to from the 90s uh, says has a quote from a famous speaker that says the greatest cause of atheism in the world today are christians who confess jesus christ with their lips but deny them by their lifestyles that's what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable it's true guys it, it really really is uh, i can definitely point to the fact that many of those people who say they're christian in churches and what are not truly following god uh with the you know uh with part of their heart much less their whole heart uh, and, and that's what's causing a lot of divorce, you know, because if you are following the Bible's commands to be truly loving and serving of your spouse, and both spouses are engaged in that practice, uh, it's hard to believe that there would be much divorce, right? Uh, so what you do see are a lot of divorces where there isn't love from one side or the other. Sometimes you just have a lot of mixed couples, you know, Christians marrying non-Christians, and that can that can cause some problems. But uh, and the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked. But even within Christian marriages, you can have uh, some some of these problems and whatever have you. Uh, but there's a lot of people who just call themselves Christians who really aren't Christian. We have a lot of people in America who check off the the, the conservative box and thinks that makes them Christian uh, and, and everything else in between. But I know I can't really ask all of you to be able to make that distinction. It's not fair. And I totally agree with you on this. So all I can tell you is what the Bible says. The Bible never once, in fact, the Bible even demonstrates that his followers, including some of the biggest ones, commit some of the most grievous sins, right? King David had Bathsheba's husband murdered. De uh, Peter denied Christ three times after being told he would. The, the Bible doesn't make any bones about this. Even us Christians who have thrown ourselves at the feet of Christ are still learning, growing, and still making plenty of really, really bad sins in our life. I don't want to use the word mistakes because they're not mistakes. They're willing disobedience, okay? And I've said it even on this video plenty of times. I'm one of those people, right? That's why I need forgiveness. I've willingly disobeyed God's word. Even after being educated, I keep willingly disobeying God's word. It's sad. It's sad. And and it's a lot of reason why Jesus warned his followers about this sort of hypocrisy, Jesus doesn't tolerate hypocrisy. It is not a good thing to be hypocritical. So we have to be very humble, very careful as Christians. And when you see a Christian who isn't humble, when you see a Christian who's like, I don't sin, when you see like the Pharisees and they're going around telling other people what to do all the time, but they themselves aren't living it out and, and, and stuff like that, that's Jesus called it out. I don't know what else, you know, he could do about that, but that's, you know, aside from turning them into robots, but it is something that is addressed in the Bible very directly. This is not a surprise. They're not hiding the ball, boys and girls. Yeah. Uh, my original point still cha change effectively and challenged because your points in making this video, which the point I was making to reply is this. Let's move to another quote. No, a person can evade accountability for literally any crime against you by merely starting to believe that someone named Jesus died as a ransom atonement for the sins and then they simply offer in their atonement. Yes. In terms of in terms of Will you, if it, okay, you're, you're not 100% correct on this, uh, Persona Nagrata. What the Bible says, and we see a great example in Paul. Paul had a lot of people killed. Did he evade any and all accountability for his sins? Negator. Negator. So the Holy Spirit came to him. He fell on his face. He became a Christian. His eternal punishment has been suspended, Right. But then he had to serve the rest of for you know, and, and, and the, the angel or whoever that spoke to him said, you are now going to live a very rough life spreading the gospel message, you know, and, and part of that was definitely in, strongly implied. It was because of his life as a sinful, you know, murderer uh, of God's children, of the Hebrews uh, and whatever have you, just because 
just because God is suspending or, or taking away or whatever the eternal punishment or destruction, depending on how you look at it, does not mean you're awake totally scot-free. Number one, there, there could still be punishment from God here on earth and what happens for the rest of your life. Number two, uh, the, the Bible makes it very clear that there are governments in place for a reason to, to help uh, limit the evil and whatever have you. And, and you have the right, uh, you, they, the government has the right to come after you for those sin, those, 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 any sins that you commit that are crimes. And indeed, you have a responsibility um, to follow up on that. Number three, you have to be truly repentant. Being truly repentant generally means, as part of that repentance, going back and trying to make up to those people that you've hurt. When you repent to your wife because you've done something really bad to her, like you, you've cheated on her, you can't you can't possibly make all of that up 100%. But if you truly are sorry, you're going to do your darndest to make it up to her. You're going to go in above and beyond to, to try to make it up to her. Buying flowers just ain't going to be enough. That's just the, the very first tiny step, right? I mean, heck, if I leave the toilet seat up, I probably have to buy my wife flowers as a sign of repentance just for leaving the toilet seat up. You know, these are repentance comes with its own cost as well in terms of truly being repentant. You're going to want to truly seek and to, to restore those people that you've hurt if you're truly repentant. And again, you can't fool God. You can't play a game. He can read your heart. You can't just go, he, he, I'm going to commit all these murders. I'm going to get away with all my stuff. And then at the last minute of my life, I'm going to say, please forgive me, God. It's going to work out. He, you can't, you can't play the game. It won't work with him. That's why he's why he's the perfect judge. You can fool earthly judges very much with promises that you never intend to keep. Oh, you, you promise to be on your best behavior for all? Yes, sir, sir. Okay, I guess I'll suspend your sentence this time, but don't do it again. In your heart, you're really like, oh, yeah, as soon as I get out of here, I'm going to keep doing it. No punishment about the actual person. Now, the other thing we don't talk about is, you know, as far as what happens in heaven, there are, there are, there are, treasures and punishments outside of eternal life and eternal death right um we talk about laying down crowns at jesus feet we talk about positions in heaven those who are going to rule over others and stuff like that if you live a life full of sin and you do have an honest repentance towards the end of your life you're not going to be in the same position uh you know in heaven and have those treasures and stuff that somebody else is going to have who led a life for god of course that in revelations we talk about laying all those treasures at jesus feet so if you if you don't want to lay treasures at Jesus' feet, you don't want to worship Jesus Christ. Heaven's a horrible deal. And they won't have to work to become a good enough person, a person who is no longer in the nature. Well, let's see here. They won't even have to work to become a good enough person, a person who is no longer in the nature of to do serious evils. They just have to believe in or at least assign themselves to the ideal. Someone else prepaid more moral debt. But I don't like this Believe it. It's a faith. You have to have faith because Satan believes that that Christ exists and that he died for for the, the sins of man. But Christ is there. But Satan isn't saved. Right. Because he doesn't put his faith in Jesus Christ and he doesn't repent of his sin. You have to truly repent of your sin and you have to truly put your faith fully into Christ. It's much better. It's much cheaper than believing in. And I, I talked at length at the difference between believing in faith and what it means to have faith and by blind faith versus a Christian faith and all that other jazz. And, and I've done a big old video on that. So, you, you know, in one of those other responses or in the original video, so you can go and check that out. In other words, the Christian offers for anyone to evade all accountability for everything horrible they'll ever do as in, as in future uh, future tense or whatever have you again like if you're if you are coming to god you know with this evil intention of totally doing all the evil horrible things in the future that you really wanted to do because you think you're off the hook god's going to see right through that and that won't be honored and whatnot now is a christian who truly loves god off the hook for you know who, who truly has repented but then later on commits an evil act, still saved. Well, the, yeah, yeah, you're right. If that's what you're arguing, persona non grata, because we see that in King David. King David was extremely faithful. As young David, he was extremely faithful. He slayed Goliath because he has such faith in Christ. He slayed, he slayed Goliath. And then, uh, but later on, he had Bathsheba's husband killed. Now, God punished him for being stupid as an ape. He did. He didn't punish him eternally. His eternal soul wasn't in jeopardy. So from that perspective that you're pointing out, he was all, you know, forgiven for that. But he did punish him here on earth. And David's faith was strong, right? Because he had his faith purely in God. So David immediately repented. 
he immediately started paying the price. And he paid the price for the rest of his life, really. You can go and read about King David in there. And it tells you a great example of how God handles a Christian who acts as stupid as an ape by doing something horrifically evil uh, after becoming saved. You don't get off scot-free for everything that you you do. And why not? So educate, you know, do a little education of yourself be before you, you, you create too many straw man arguments would be my advice there. And then last one from, from Gemma, you can claim that your God is good, doesn't make it so. The Gospels, while discovering a variety of Jesuses, from Mark, mostly human Jesus, to John's frailty, lacking pro take Jesus, do not describe someone who be capable of atrocities in the Old Testament. Um, the, the, G, G, the, you're talking about the, the G, Jesus who, who blasted the Pharisees, turned over all the tables in the, the temple, and then... Um, and I remember he had very scathing words for people. He talked more about hell than heaven. He warned people left and right. And then immediately after he was taken to heaven and the apostles that he had taught directly were establishing the church. I forget their names, but there was two people in the book of Acts. It's really right after the, the, the second coming of Christ. And they lied about the money that they made from selling their land that they were donating to the church. They're like, look at all this money we made. We're giving it to the church. And Peter said, you're lying before God, your life is forfeit. And you can read that story. You, 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 no, no. I mean, God is judging throughout even even the Jesus times and whatever have you. Um, do you really think someone who cares about lost children this much, how think ye, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gone astray, doth leave the ninety-nine and nine, and goeth, I always never a big fan of the old King James versions because we don't speak in these terms anymore. Goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray. And if so, be that he find it. Verily I say to you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than ninety of the nine that not went astray. Do you really think someone who cares about lost children this much would murder the children of slaves to show off how powerful he was to Pharaoh? Um, who he was mind controlling to keep him from preventing him from being reasonable. You know, the topic of, of God hardening the heart of Pharaoh, I and mean, there's been a book or two, you know, written it, written on that in terms of God hardening Pharaoh's heart uh, and, and whatever have you. Um, but has, has God demonstrated his power to the masses and in doing so killed many people, whether they were babies or old people or anything in between? Absolutely. We see it every time a hurricane comes on shore, right? That's God's power and display. Every time there's an earthquake, Jesus says the rain falls on the just and unjust. Not all rain is good rain, right? Some of them are tip of storms that kill people, natural disasters. The Pharisees, the Pharisees were quick to come up and say, hey, wait a minute, this building fell over and killed all these people. It was clearly an act of God. So, oh gosh, what, what was that exact one? Let's read that one together. Building fell over, killed people, Jesus, Pharisees, got, you know, uh, the um, 18 people, it's in Luke 13, Luke 13, let's take up 13, and so, you know, there were some who were present at the time that, uh, let's see, no, that's a little bit further on, parable of their tree, um, there were some who were present at the very time when he told them about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners? Oh, uh, okay, I'm making sure I got the right verse here. But he said, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffer this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you'll likewise perish. Or the 18 on whom the tower in Salaam fell and killed them. Do you think there are worse offenders than all those who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but at least you repent, you will likewise perish. Because the common theology back then was these bad things were happening to people because they had done bad things or whatever have you. And, you know, Jesus is sitting there saying, um, uh, you know, you need to worry about yourself. Uh, you know, things happen. God God lets people die or you can, he kills people, whatever you want to call it. And, um, and what you need to worry about is yourself. Because unless you repent, you will likewise, you know, perish. But, you know, you tie this in later on with verses where he says, be worried about those who can kill the spirit, not the flesh. The fleshly death is is not the, the highest 
pinnacle of, of judgment or righteousness or evilness or whatever have you. It is very evil when we kill people out of murder because we're not the perfect judge uh, and whatever have you. We don't have the rights for all the reasons I've just described, you know, earlier. Uh, so we are we are right to be upset when Hitler or whoever that Chinese ruler that killed everyone, Tiamat Square, or any of those guys do a whole bunch of murder because they're not God. They, they don't have the right to kill people like that, and yet they do. Uh, we have every right to be upset at them. Uh, but when God kills people, he can for all the reasons I've described earlier uh, because he is the righteous judge. He, But much worse than somebody who kills the body is someone who can kill the spirit. Uh, that's a much worse death because, you know, your spirit is theoretically e eternal. And um, it, and so that's what you should be more concerned about. And and for that, you don't have to worry about people getting in the way of that. That's only God. Don't be worried about those people who can kill the body. Christians shouldn't be worried about people who can kill the body. They should be worried about the eternal judgment because only God can, can decide what happens with your soul. Anyways, I do have to get running. Uh, I think we are pushing close to an hour on this. Uh, Gemma, thank you so much for taking all the time to write this out. Uh, would be nice maybe if some of these were just one long post rather than a whole bunch of little posts. But for the most part, I appreciate you um, taking the time out. Uh, Jimba, damn, Jimba went on beast mode. Well, I just responded to everything. Does that mean I went into super beast mode or responsive beast mode? Uh, I, I don't I don't know. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you guys taking the time. Again, I, I probably won't keep responding and doing all these videos because uh, they are uh, a little bit on the time consuming side and it keeps me from doing other things like playing video games. And that's so important, playing those video games. But no, I, I do have other things I need to get done. Uh, but you are welcome. Again, I welcome all of you who are so passionate about this. Uh, you're welcome to talk with me on Discord, JC Servant. You can look me up. I'm, I'm happy to have I had a conversation with... Um, with uh, you know the Fed guy and stuff, and and I appreciate him taking the time out. I'm happy to have conversations with anybody else who wants to um, talk with me about this uh, on vocal chat. It's much easier because it's a lot to talk about, and we go back and forth. And I can do other things like house chores and driving and stuff while I'm doing that. But I'm always happy to talk with anybody who truly, really, really wants to talk. Now I get the feeling that some people just really, really want to argue. I'm not pointing anyone out here in the comments section or Jim or anybody else. Uh, at, at some point, I, I just kind of, you know, move on because again, better things to do with my time. Originally, this video was just intended for a couple of friends to watch. Of course, I put on YouTube. That means anybody can watch, anybody can comment on it. Of course, I'm not, you know, complaining about that or whatever have you. But given that it's not my original purpose, I won't continue to spend too much time on responding to stuff. Uh, it's not that I'm not able or whatever have you, but there is only so much time in the day. Uh, but with that being said, if you truly are like, man, I think Phil really, I really like to hear what Phil has to say about this or whatever have you, uh, you can always shoot uh, shoot me off a Discord message. Uh, I, you know, there's a ton of responses coming in through, I didn't even get to all the new responses on the main video. Uh, there's a ton of responses kind of coming in and I just, one person, I simply can't uh, keep up with it all. But if you reach out to me on Discord, that to me tells me, because it's pretty easy to do, most people have Discord, that tells me that you really maybe are willing to go with the extra effort and trying to convince me or uh, trying to prove a point or you really truly are looking for um, a new answer or whatever. And so I'll, I'll, I'll prioritize uh, those types of things. Because I think everybody, uh, not everybody, I'm sorry, but a, a number of people on here are just going to be kind of continuing the arguing for uh, for whatever reason uh, that isn't quite as sincere. So, but other than that, thank you guys very much. Uh, I got to head off and get some things done today, but I hope you all have a great morning in the Lord. May God bless you and um, see you around. Go back to making other types of videos. Bye.